Now, please welcome to the stage Chris Carrico, who will explain to us why everyone loves a blood sport. Yes, they're there for a reason. Scene, I think I may have to raise the stand. I'm very sorry. Oh, you're getting it? At the beginning of the night, who's your tallest speaker? Oh, I think it's Chris. Oh, it should be fine. No. <laughs> True facts. At my doctor's appointment yesterday, apparently I've gotten an inch taller since last year. I don't fucking know. I'm 30 goddamn five. I'm too old for this shit. Hi, everyone. I'm Chris. Some of you may have heard me speak here before about things that I'm an expert about, like aging biology, or things that I'm an amateur about, like ejection seats. Tonight, I'm an amspert or an expature. Uh, tonight, I'm talking to you about punching people in the face and the human urge to grapple with our problems. Aside from the multi-front tire fire that is modern politics, one of the more interesting news stories scientifically thank you, is the social conversation about chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE, mostly how it affects football players and how by progressively turning their brains to mush, leads into violent behavior, premature dementia, and a number of other health problems, both for themselves and others, like murder. Uh, the thing is, People like to talk about how this is going to mean the end of football, this is going to mean the end of boxing, which is mostly what I'm here to talk to you about. Um, and I think that's bullshit uh, for a couple of important reasons. So there's this concept in anthropology or social psychology of a cultural universal, which means something that all human cultures have done throughout history as far as we've been able to tell. And there aren't a lot of those, as you might imagine. But one of them is wrestling. So it turns out that the most important piece of safety equipment when you're doing some sort of sport where you fight each other for fun and entertainment is rules. And the nice thing about wrestling is it's the only piece of safety equipment you need because you can do it literally naked as long as you have an agreement about what you can and can't do. And so this is an Egyptian burial mural from 4,000 years ago showing wrestlers doing approximately the same techniques that we do now. And wrestling is great because it lets people play fight fairly safely with each other using only bodies and rules. And it makes sense that nearly every human society we know of has figured out a way to pull this shit off. And a lot of societies over the years, or many years, have included punching people in that balance. So this is Greece. The Greek Olympics lasted a thousand years until their suppression by the Romans in about 400 AD, uh, beginning with wrestling, adding boxing, and then adding basically MMA. We're so original, including youth groups for both of those sports. Fighters wrapped leather straps, sorry, this isn't leather, around their hands for protection and hit each other until one gave up or was incapacitated. And if you broke the limited rules, the judges would beat you with a whip. Very on theme for last weekend. <laughs> and if you might ask, as many people do, why you would do this goddamn stupid thing when you would fight to the point of incapacitation for the entertainment of a crowd, this is one reason. This is the Diagoras International Airport in the island of Rhodes, which already made an appearance tonight in Greece. Who's Diagoras, you might ask? Well, he's an Olympic boxing champion. And that sounds fairly reasonable until you take into account the fact that Diagoras was a two-time Olympic boxing champion 2,400 goddamned years ago. <laughs> Rhodes is so stoked about this guy, they waited until they invented airplanes and then named the airport after him. <laughs> that is, as we say, a high bar for noting achievement. His, his three kids also became Olympic champions, yes, all of them. Uh, and as two of them carried him around the Olympic ring when he was like 70 or some shit, someone was like, this is the happiest he'll ever be, and he died right after. Uh, <laughs> good story. So uh, these sports originally had a, a practical application. The practical application was one part training uh, to, to, to fight the people in the next town over without hurting the people in your town, and then eventually, uh, coming up with an outlet for all this aggression we had as a bunch of murder apes, uh, without 
fighting the next town where you could still get bragging rights without having to actually stab someone with a sepsis-inducing spear wound. Um, and a lot of them were shaped by the, the fighting environment they came up in. So in ancient Greece, for example, you had a bunch of sweaty, oily men pushing into each other in a giant pile. Uh, and the, only the people at the front rank actually poked spears in. Thank you. So regional differences in combat sports can usually be linked to regional differences in how people fought, at least until the Roman Empire decided that shit wasn't enough because we're fucking bored and we got a city of a million people in 100 AD. And shit starts to get weird. So anytime you've got a truly out there fighting sport, boxing included, uh, odds are pretty good that spectators don't have to do the actual fighting uh, because then you would have come up with rules that made goddamn sense. And so if you have someone with, with armor that consists of a helmet and chiseled abs fighting another man with a trident and a net in front of 65,000 screaming fans who don't have to fight ever, then something has gone very economically right and very maybe culturally wrong. <laughs> Which brings us to medieval and then colonial Europe. Uh, so Europe basically spent the millennium after the Roman Empire fighting each other and literally everyone else they could find to the death. Uh, and they got such, such cultural monuments as knightly jousting um, and the, the Inquisition. Uh, and so a lot of the combat sports they came up with as, as the industrial period started were quite dangerous because these people are psychotic murderers that travel the globe looking for people to kill. And so they wanted to sand down the rough edges so they didn't kill all of themselves. And so fencing, for example, which is one of the first modern combat sports, uh, originally oriented as stabbing someone in the fucking chest, and then turned into a sport because when you're trying to market it to rich people that need their heirs to survive, you say, well, it's going to teach them all this martial spirit and stuff, but we have safety equipment now, so they'll get all the martial spirit and health without the health and spirit degrading sides of uh, uh, sepsis. <laughs> so... Uh, about a century after fencing got modernized, it was boxing's turn to be ruined. <laughs> and this happened at Cambridge. Uh, this is the Marquess of Keensbury, uh, who came up with the rules that you've probably heard of. Or rather, he didn't come up with the rules you've heard of. He, uh, he put his name on them after someone without a landed title came up with them named John Graham Chambers. You may have also heard of this asshole for ruining Oscar Wilde's life because Oscar was banging his son. Fuck that guy, not literally. Uh, and, and so they were a very forward-thinking athletic club because you didn't have to be an, a member of the upper, pla upper classes to compete. You just had to have enough free time to compete in these non-moneyed contests and not have an actual job that required you to not train all the goddamn fucking time. So, uh, so, so yeah, uh, uh, landed gentry of Britain broke another perfectly good way to kill people for fun. Um, and as a side note, and I'm not, I cut most of these out because a lot of the cool martial arts from around the world, if I only include one slide of them, come across as tokenizing some country or its fighting art. And literally every goddamn martial art in the world that has a, enough information to have an, a historical article has dozens of people that live their whole fucking lives as, for like this is a major passion. So I'm not going to do that. But I am going to do this one. This is shin kicking. This was invented in England in 1612 and lasted until 1852 in the common pasture land they used to hold the Cotswold Olympic Games, and it's Olympic spelled wrong like you might imagine, was privatized by capitalist landowners, sold off and enclosed. Yeah, that's right. Let me hear your hisses. <laughs> Fuck capitalism. So the trend of perfectly good public sports that are accessible to the public, because all you need is your fucking hands, or in this case, your shins, getting ruined by landed capital was already well underway by the time we got to boxing. So the major addition of these Cambridge amateurs was that for the first time in thousands of years since these Greek assholes, gloved boxing became more popular than the ungloved prize fighting that used to be the main sport in the British Islands, and which used to actually support professional prize fighters that fought for money and that actually needed the money and like these landed jerks. And so in, uh, when a British court in 1882 declared that bare knuckle boxing constituted assault with intent, intent to cause bodily harm even in a consensual fight, thus criminalizing someone's consensual way of having fun, <laughs> the landed gentry won again those assholes. So Joe, eh, so Joe Lewis, pictured here on the side, 
fighting uh, uh, Max Schmeling, who was supported by the fucking Nazis, uh, became a, no, well, well, his Schmeling, but Joe Lewis is fucking rad, and also manages to take historical pride of place as one of the first black athletes the U.S., the whole U.S., actually got together behind. Boxing took the lead over other major sports that were popular in the 30s and 40s in terms of including people that didn't look waspy as fuck and allowing them to not only compete but be celebrated by the entire country. And yeah, nationalism's a shit deal, but like at least sometimes you can harness to, to, to foster actual cultural advancement. And boxing really, because it's a, a, an individual contest probably, had some structural advantages over the team sports that were being a bag of assholes to people. And Joe Lewis was not the only heavyweight champion in the country then celebrated. And some of these, including Muhammad Ali, shown in his later years here, became very major cultural figures, thank you, for things like political activism, including anti-war protests, that you had to get this level of platform to push. Or uh, being, in, in his case, one of the first people to really be like a public case that was visible of someone having to deal with a neurological disease like Parkinson's that's helped advance our dialogue on that kind of chronic disease in ways that it wouldn't have been possible to do otherwise. Which brings us back to chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CPE, CTE, sorry. Uh, and so, so now, <laughs> Casey's gonna help me with a little demonstration. So, gloves. CTE is a disease that happens to your brain as a result of getting hit too many times. And it, it kind of causes the tissue to collapse in on itself as the neurons die. And uh, uh, one of the things about gloves, gloves are protective equipment. The Greeks use them as such because they hold the bones of your hand together and they keep them, keep them from getting knocked out of alignment by impacts. So if you Hold up this one. If you punch a target without gloves on your hand, you can hit it meh hard. If you hit it with a wrap on, it's maybe a little better. But if you get a fucking one pound padded boxing glove, you wrap it up all tight so it's nice and snug, you get a nice target surface to hit. It's significantly harder as an impact. And so the problem then is that by protecting your hands with this glove, you're allowing yourself to su successfully transmit more energy into your opponent's brain, which causes problems in the longer term. And so it's now possible, technologically speaking, to mess someone up pretty badly. And so it's worth noting that a lot of the early boxers in the gloved boxing tradition including John uh, Chambers, who came up with the rules, died very early. Chambers died at 40 for unlisted causes. Early, early boxers in the British Isles around the same time also often died around 40. Joe Lewis, from our previous slides, died at age 66 after decades of mysterious substance abuse problems. Muhammad Ali was diagnosed with Parkinson's at 42, without, as far as I know, any genetic risk factors for it. There is a real downside here, which we mostly know about, not because of boxing per se, but because of football. Because boxers are at least trying not to get hit. But football players, especially in the offensive and defensive line, are pile driving into each other with hundreds of pounds behind them every goddamn day. And so one of the things that football has given us is the public awareness that concussions are bad for us, which is extremely useful. I've personally had a concussion, not from getting punched in the face, although that's happened a lot, but from falling off a bicycle. <laughs> and since you basically win a boxing match by giving someone a concussion so they fall unconscious, it says some bad things about boxing, MMA, Muay Thai, and every other combat sport that has knockouts in it. And so some people would wonder, why don't we just shut that shit down? In any discussion of risk, you have to balance what you're risking versus what you stand to gain if you win. And in the case of combat sports in particular, uh, there's a couple of major things. One, if you don't have a lot of economic outlets from where you are, boxing, MMA, or any other combat sport will frequently provide a pretty good way out. Either you become a professional fighter, you become a training professional, you become a, a stunt person like Helen Gibson, or a number of related avenues. And two, if someone is telling you you can't make whatever the fuck you want out of yourself in the world, 
a fight is the most viscerally satisfying way of proving them wrong. And I can attest to that as a bunch of people are chuckling about out in the crowd. But other people like Ronda Rousey here have too. Moreover, as long as there are things that are worth risking your personal safety over, as long as the baseline assumption that if you don't fight, no one punches you in the fucking face, you're going to be safe is wrong, then there are things that are worth literally fighting over and which literal fights can teach you the metaphorical skills or that can teach you the skills to metaphorically fight over. And so Colin Kaepernick here, after getting tackled numbers of times in football, at some point is willing to say, fuck it, I'm going to do whatever I want because Black Lives Matter and I'm going to do whatever I can to support that cause as publicly as possible. And that platform is afforded to him and the philosophies that allow him to do that are afforded to him by a sport that says that rather than fostering your own safety wherever possible, you should find the position from where you can win the most advantage in a balanced assessment of risk. And as long as that's true, saying, oh, well, I don't think it makes sense to risk getting your brain pounded to mush isn't going to successfully stamp out fighting, which is to say, if you have a glass in your hand, as long as there's something worth fighting for, fighting's not going to stop. Thank you. <laughs>